This is the second set of uh, moisture notes for chapter 17. And chapter 17 is the second part of the atmosphere uh, unit one. All right, so we're concluding, wrapping up the last part of the notes for the entire first unit of meteorology. Let's get started. All right. Um, <clears throat> reminder about condensation. We talked about energy and heat and latent heat and why that's so very important. How when water vapor cools off and then condenses back into um, a liquid when it forms uh, clouds or when it forms precipitation, does that by uh, dropping down below the dew point. Um, it releases substantial amounts of energy into the atmosphere and that can help drive wind and weather and storms and rain and things like that. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about clouds in particular. Okay. Clouds are simply tiny microscopic water droplets. Clouds are not a gas. Uh, they're visible because they are microscopic water droplets. Now these water droplets are much smaller than rain droplets which is why they float in the air. They're very buoyant. Uh, they float in the air because they're so tiny. Okay? In order for clouds to form, um, you gotta have three things. One of them is condensation nuclei. Uh, when we do the lab for clouds, when we make clouds in jars, you guys are gonna find out that condensation nuclei are very, very important. So in order for clouds to actually form, um, you have to have moisture in the air. Generally, it starts with warm air because warm air can hold more moisture. We learned that last set of notes. Secondly, you have to take that warm air and you have to drop its temperature. In nature, this is generally done by moving that air up. As it moves up, its temperature drops. And then lastly, you have to have some sort of condensation nuclei. Some sort of microscopic dust particle, some sort of uh, material... Uh, ice crystal, dust, dirt, things like that suspended in air that the water droplets can adhere to and begin to form around. All right, when that happens, your clouds will form. There are three basic types of clouds. And we're going to spend a lot of time on these over the next couple weeks. Um, hopefully you'll have an understanding of the cloud type, how to recognize them, and how to use them with uh, basic weather forecasting. There's cirrus clouds, cumulus clouds, stratus clouds. This diagram just tries to give you an idea of the scale. Here's the size of the typical raindrop down here. That would be two millimeters across. And your typical cloud droplets in comparison are these guys, just microscopic. And because they are so small, they're buoyant, and therefore they float in the air. Types of clouds. A lot of info on this slide, okay? Three types, cirrus, cumulus, stratus, all right? All clouds are broken up into uh, different types based upon two categories. First category is what they look like their shape. The second characteristic that needs to be considered when um, categorizing clouds and understanding them is their altitude, their height above the surface. Okay? You've seen all these cloud types before, so it's just a matter of recognizing them. Cirrus clouds are always high level because they're high level, they're always going to be thin. The air is very thin up there. These are um, very thin, wispy, feather-like, um, and they're always going to be made of ice. In fact, the kind of the background, the backdrop of this slide uh, that you're looking at, these thin, wispy clouds in the background, those are cirrus clouds. Second is cumulus. These are individual cottony clouds, they're going to have flat bases and going to have puffy tops. 
These are the ones that you drew in <clears throat> elementary art class. Flat tops, or excuse me, flat bases and puffy tops. These are always going to be associated with fair weather. You know that because these flat bases of them denote and give us an indication that the air is very stable uh, as opposed to looking at a thunderstorm where the air would be very unstable. Stratus clouds are going to be sheets or layers, just thick horizontal layers of clouds. You really can't see individual clouds, but uh, an overcast day is generally going to be stratus clouds. Stratus clouds can sometimes bring fog, and sometimes they can bring rain. All right. High level clouds, let's talk about altitude, altitude now. High level clouds are going to be 6,000 meters and up, so we're talking 20,000 feet and up. Very, very cold. You can have general cirrus clouds, you can have a mix and match called cirrocumulus clouds, and you can also have a mix and match called cirrostratus clouds. Those are all high level clouds. Huh? Medium level clouds, we add the prefix alto to. Alto is a prefix meaning medium high. If you know uh, band or choir, in choir the alto voice is the female voice, but it's the lower portion of the female voice, so kind of medium high. And uh, if you're in band, alto saxophone is kind of a medium high version of the saxophone. So two of these, you can have alto cumulus clouds, which means a medium high cumulus cloud. You're going to have alto stratus, with stratus, which is a medium high leveled cloud. Then our low clouds, just a few thousand meters off the surface, include our cumulus clouds, our stratus clouds, a combination of those two, stratocumulus, and then lastly, nimbostratus. Um, if you include the word nimbus on any cloud, it means it's raining. You have nimbostratus, and then you also have cumulonimbus, which we'll learn a lot about those towards the end of the school year, because cumulonimbus clouds are thunderstorms. Some examples of a few, not of all, but uh, starting from the upper left, these up here, these are our cirrus clouds. Literally looks like someone took a paintbrush and didn't really have a lot of paint on that brush and just kind of made a few brush strokes and you had thin, uh, thin paint covering. Those are cirrus clouds. Very thin because it's so high up and these are actually all made of ice crystals. Um, second one, individual little cotton uh, balls, but they're very spread out and they're very small, which means they're thin and they're high. So this actually would be a cirrocumulus combination. Example here, flat bottoms, puffy tops, cumulus clouds. Flat bottoms, puffy tops, flat, cumulus. These are going to be fair weather, beautiful days, beautiful spring days, beautiful summer days, no precipitation, a little bit of moisture in the air. Lastly, stratocumulus. Stratocumulus is overcast, but you can almost discern individual clouds here, but not quite. It's like cumulus clouds that are all run together. So it's a combo of the layers and the individual puffy cumulus clouds. And this one looks like it's probably about to bring some rain, so that might turn into a nimbo stratus cloud soon. Put them all together you'd see something like this, low level clouds, stratus, stratocumulus, cumulus, medium level clouds, alto cumulus. Notice the difference between alto cumulus and regular cumulus. Cumuluses are bigger and lower to the ground. Alto cumuluses are higher up, more spread out, and smaller. You also have alto stratus, again higher up layers and a little bit thinner. And then you get up to the higher level clouds, cumulo, excuse me, high level clouds, cirro cumulus, again, even smaller little puffs and more spread out. Cirro stratus, even thinner flat layers, 
and then lastly, high-level cirrus clouds. The last one over here on the right is called cumulonimbus, and these are your thunderstorms. Massive amounts of instability causes the air to rise very quickly. Very quickly it rises up, then it crashes back down, and you get the severe weather. Massive amounts of rain, significant lightning, heavy winds, flooding. Oftentimes, as a cumulonimbus cloud surges upward, it reaches a maximum height and it flattens out. That flat top of a thunderstorm we sometimes call an anvil head. If you know what an anvil is, it's, uh, it's that thing that Wile E. Coyote would try and drop on the roadrunner. It's uh, a giant piece of metal that metallurgists would use to bang out swords and tools and things like that. That's what an anvil head is. Okay? All right. So I would study this uh, diagram, this illustration from your notes. Uh, you're going to have a handout on it, and you need to be able to recognize all types of clouds. Cirro cumulus, cirro stratus, cirrus, alto cumulus, alto stratus as our medium level, and then stratus clouds, strato cumulus clouds, cumulus clouds, and then I forgot nimbo stratus. These are the rainy days. Not a thunderstorm, but just overcast, light to medium rain. Usually brings rain for two, three hours at a time. Fog is simply a cloud near the ground. Well, how do you get fog? Well, we talked about how clouds form. You've got to have warm, moist air. You have to cool it off sufficiently, and you have to have condensation nuclei. Generally, the way air cools off is by going up in altitude. Fog forms when the temperatures near the surface drop to a point where the water can condense at the surface. All right? Kind of some special conditions. Um, some rare conditions, I should say, but not necessarily special. All right, so let's look at the different types of fog. The problem with fog is it can be a hazard because it can really reduce visibility for drivers and um, pilots. Advection fog, you get warm, moist air. It moves over a cool surface such as a cold body of water or maybe a snow-covered field. So the warm, moist air gets up and over that cool surface. That is what drops the temperature, and then condensation occurs and you get the fog. San Francisco Bay, this happens quite a bit because warm, moist air over the land spills out over the cold ocean. If you know San Francisco Bay, the Pacific Ocean up there is actually very cold. Um, so it cools it off, and you get this thick, thick, thick fog forming. We do not get this type of fog here in North Texas because the water that we have here in North Texas is warm. Our lakes stay warm in the winter. Radiation fog forms on a cool, generally clear night. Uh, when Earth's surface, uh, the temperature drops very rapidly. Air becomes more dense. As it cools off, it kind of spills into low-lying areas or maybe into areas where there's no, um, there's no roadways, no concrete, no housing, things like that, generally out in fields and stuff like that. And as it cools off substantially, it condenses radiation fog. This we certainly get here in Texas. This is the type of fog that we form early in the morning um, or late, 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 late at night. Another type of steam fog. This isn't very thick. This is if... Uh, Basically, if you find yourself sitting in a hot tub in the wintertime and you have these small pockets of vapor rising up from the warm water up into the cold air, um, that's a type of steam fog. All right? We can get that around here over warm water in November when it cools off substantially or in uh, the springtime when the water is beginning to warm up, we still have cool nights. How does precipitation form? Let's talk a little bit about precipitation. Okay, there's something called uh, the Bergeron process, and that involves something called supercooled. What you need to know about supercooled is that you can have liquid water, and this is an interesting phenomenon, you can have liquid water droplets at high altitudes suspended up in the air that are actually below zero degrees Celsius. This is a bizarre phenomenon. 
How could you have liquid water below the freezing point of liquid? Well, when certain pressures and um, temperatures arise, you can kind of uh, cheat the freezing point a little bit. All right? So when you drop the air temperature at high altitudes, below freezing, microscopic water droplets can sometimes remain liquid. Once they come in contact with uh, an ice crystal or something like that, they will freeze on contact and that ice crystal then gets very, very large. So it would be a small little ice crystal to begin with. Then you have water droplets that come in contact with that. <clears throat> and those then freeze on contact and your ice crystal gets bigger and bigger and bigger and finally gets heavy enough and it drops. And as it drops, it drops into warmer air and that can form rain. It's one way precipitation can form. Coalition, coalescence process, if you've ever watched raindrops on a window pane or raindrops on your windshield of your car, you might notice several small little drops and as they try and fall, they lump together and then you get big drops and then those big drops are heavy enough and they fall out of the sky or they drip down your window pane much faster. That's basically how coalition coalescence works in the air. Um, <clears throat> so Bergeron, here you have a small ice crystal, you have water molecules that are still in the liquid state, they're super cooled and as they come in contact with this ice crystal, that ice crystal grows, snow in essence, that snowflake is large enough, it begins to drop and then it melts, turns back into um, water and reaches the surface as rain. Different types of precipitation we'll talk about, you can measure uh, precipitation as liquid forms or solid forms. It doesn't have to just fall from the sky. It can actually condense directly on the surface. You wake up in the morning and you find dew or precipitation on your blades of grass or on your bushes, on your uh, flower bed, or even on your car if you park it outside. Um, that counts as precipitation. It's a microscopic amount, but it is um, precipitation. You can measure, measure precipitation in a couple different ways. Total precipitation that's fallen over a given time period. Two days ago, we received uh, 0.8 inches of rain or something like that. Okay, Or we had an inch, uh, inch and a half of rain yesterday. It was a good soaking rain. Okay, um, <clears throat> Or you can give a rate. A rate of uh, precipitation is important when you're talking about flooding because the rain can only soak in at a particular uh, rate. You can only have so much water soak into the ground and if you get precipitation rate falling every hour greater than what the ground can soak in, you're going to have some serious flooding problems. So meteorologists and hazard people will definitely um, be on the lookout for the rate at which severe storms drop rainfall. Alright, so precipitation in the liquid form, you can read these. There's dew, that forms directly on the surface. Then there's basically three forms of rain, but they have different names. There's mist, which is very, very small. You can only notice it um, if you're moving or if the wind is blowing. Then there's drizzle, more or less light rain. And then you have rain. And rain can be a variety of different, uh, t uh, several different types. Large raindrops, small raindrops, heavy rain, uh, light rain big thunderstorm range, those giant drops which go thwap, thwap, thwap on your windshield when you're driving. Um, solid forms of precipitation include glaze. Okay, so these are all ice. Glaze forms when supercooled water in the air, this would have to be near the surface obviously, supercooled water in the air near the surface, so obviously the temperature is dropped below zero degrees, when that supercooled water comes in contact with the surface, which is below zero degrees, it will freeze on contact. And you can start getting icing on surfaces. And this is very, very dangerous. Okay. Uh, let's jump down to rime ice real quick before we get to hail. Rime ice is similar to glaze, but um, it's more delicate because it doesn't form from supercooled water droplets in the air. It forms from cloud droplets. So fog near the surface 
the temperature is below zero degrees, this fog comes in contact with the surface and freezes on contact. Um, still a hazard, but uh, not as thick as glaze ice. Hail forms in thunderstorms, and we will learn all about these. Here's an example of a massive hailstone. Hail forms high up in thunderstorms, 30, 40,000 feet up, and then these ice bombs drop to the surface. Sleet is basically um, freezing rain. When there is a warm layer up above, it's called a temperature inversion. A warm layer higher up, it starts to rain, and then there's a cold layer down near the surface that is slipped in underneath that warm layer. The raindrops fall through that sub-freezing layer, and then those sleet pellets reach the ground. And we get this quite a bit here in North Texas, so you should be familiar with that. Certainly leads to us oftentimes being uh, out of school on ice days, bad weather days. Snow, you know what that is, all right? So here's an example of how different uh, precipitation forms. High level altitude, you'll get snow or ice. As it drops, it warms up, it melts, and you get rain. Okay? Um, and this thing shows you the temperature profile. As you go high up in altitude, the temperature drops below freezing. Okay? Snow starts frozen, remains frozen. The temperature profile does not get above freezing by the time it gets to the surface. Okay? Here's sleet. You get this temperature inversion. You have this sub-freezing rain, excuse me, sub-freezing layer down here. You have the warm layer here. So rain falls down into the sub-freezing layer and you get the little sleet pellets. Okay? <clears throat> Glaze down here. You have the super cooled water at the surface comes in contact with the frozen surface down here and you get glaze ice on the surface. Very dangerous, very much a hazard. A chart showing you different types, basically explaining everything we just talked about. <clears throat> you will not see, we will not cover the precipitation type called grapple, so don't worry about that. Sometimes called soft hail, just don't worry about that. All right, if you have any questions over uh, precipitation, clouds, how precipitation forms. It's all about energy. You have to warm, or start with warm air that has moisture in it, and then you have to drop that temperature. Cool it off, you'll create clouds, you'll create precipitation, all the while you're giving off energy, and that energy is then used to drive the precipitation and drive the weather that accompanies the precipitation. Good luck. If you have any questions, come and talk to us.